So let's get into the actual text of the book here. Um, I, I, this first spread, I think, is one of the most beautiful, striking spreads I've seen in my life. And I mean, we are going to talk a lot, a lot about J.H. Williams' art, but also about Dave Stewart's colors here, which are a huge factor in the look of this book. But oh my gosh, like what a, I could probably talk for an hour about this page in all honesty. Yes, I will it. try not to. You're like, <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Episode one, page one. So I am kind of historically known as someone who is not, you know, that interested into arts. I think like you are the art uh, person while I'm more of a text person, but this is this, and this is considered to be a huge compliment from me at least that i spent at least like you know minutes on each pages just admiring the art like that to me like especially like the way the paneling is like you know you showed this first uh page over here and you know the next if, even the following pages and then as we later go into when alice is introduced to the story like the way it is um kind of it flow like it, the way that it's paneled and everything's kind of points in the d different directions and then they put like fight scenes in ingrained in like uh, in the color and everything. oh it's it's just it's just a work of art pretty much yeah and i think i i have to think that and i caught myself thinking this as I, as I read it if it was by some other artist even an amazing artist right. i don't know that it would have had the bomb blast impact that it does with just look at this page Stewart. over here this flash page i i yeah. have that actually on my batwoman guide because it's like the definitive batwoman page to me oh really oh my god this is amazing yes sorry so i actually want to let's talk about the art a little bit so something that is really striking to me immediately from these first couple pages is the way that batwoman is styled she's got this like chalk white skin and the mm -hmm. black and red costume and even the way she's colored she's almost colored to look like she's her own black and white photograph that and then has this pop of red like you don't see any kind of color toning on her skin at all and she she actually looks like a vampire and between like the paneling kind of being all carved up and the coloring and then on the second page she like grabs this this perp's head and pulls him to her and says tell me rush whispered in my ear and she's yeah. like she's creepy it's like a little she's a little scary um i mean batman has his moments where he's very gothic but i i don't i don't know that batman started out as being viscerally scary the way that batwoman is here but do you think also that her red is to kind of contrast what batman's gray black and gray is gray to to batman's black and gray yes and i also think that i mean it does a very interesting thing from a character design standpoint that that's her hair in real life too and that it's like so vivid if we go to these real life scenes J. H. Williams immediately completely changes his art style. It looks much more like an indie comic, and also Dave Stewart's colors are much more subtle here. They remind me of like, and this is came after this, but like Matt Hollingsworth coloring Hawkeye, where it's like a really specific kind of dialed down color palette, and yet still the red is like a pop. And I just think that like it, it's interesting because red is often it's the color of blood and violence, but also of passion. And I think that denotes a lot about Kate Kane, both in civilian guise and as Batwoman, even though she personally is actually rather stoic. And I think like the red actually winds up communicating a lot about her character and the choice to not just cover up her head in a cow, right? She doesn't have, what what female hero wears a mask that covers her whole face like that, but then also has all of that hair. It's pretty unusual, right. it's a choice. <laughs> Right. But the thing is, like, that actually pays off later on. And, you know, we also see, like, in, in a couple of pages later, uh, Batwoman comes and, you know, Bat explains to her to say that, oh, lose the hair. And <laughs> we come to find out that, oh, it's just a, it just, it's actually a wig that she kind of puts on. And then later it kind of pays off uh, in a fighting thing. So here there's mentioned, and, you know, oh, I don't know whether you know it, that, you know, she was th this, this cult that's trying to hunt her down. And, you know, because apparently she is an avatar of something and they needed to sacrifice her. Um, is that something that comes from 52 or? Yeah, that's actually, it's from the the run of 52 with renee montoy that we were speaking about before it was just like that that was her little business to do in gotham she's tracking down this cult but then it turns out that the cult is looking for somebody who turns out to be batwoman and they kind of like trick her into letting batwoman get captured and they're going to sacrifice her but what rucka and rucka was one of the writers of 52. Okay. But, but what comes out of that here is that they didn't manage to kill batwoman and so now all of the original cultists are quite sure that the prophecy was wrong 
Mm -hmm. Well, sort of get to that. And because she lived. And so they've broken off from the rest of the cult. Meanwhile, the rest of the cult, which is also like a crime gang as everything is in Gotham, sends right. in a new leader who is this Alice, who's, who's right. Alice in Wonderland incarnate. Uh, and also, uh, you have to wonder, like, how effective, there are some crazy people in Gotham, but how how effective is a supervillain leader of a crime cult that can only speak in, in Alice in Wonderland? Is she a great strategist? How does she, how are her business meetings? I, well, she only had a one book in her library. That's pretty much, you know, what it uh, was. And, you know, and I think, like, you know, we, we chatted about that a little bit, too, that it's like, I often find it to be a, like, kind of strange gimmick to when a writer kind of uses... Um, like, you know, dialogues from a different, like a different famous book as like, you know, that they're all speaking to them because previous to you mentioning it, I had no idea that this came from Alice in Wonderland. You didn't know or, at all? No, not I at mean, all. she's dressed like out now? No, 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 I knew that bit. I knew that bit. But like, you didn't the, know the dialogue was from Alice Yeah, in like I didn't know that the dialogues were like, you know, just uh, like, you know, the, the, the directly taken from it. And then that every single one of her dialogue, the dialogue is like that. Which to me, don't get me wrong, I think was super like, you know, it's very um, intelligent, like, or it's very like, you know, cool to do, try to be able to do that. And actually like, you know, she making some sense or giving that aura of like, okay, this is a crazy person. <laughs> but at the same time, if it's like someone like me who is not familiar with it, it just gets lost a little bit. Yeah, I, you know, it's always impressive to me when I first see an author doing this because as much as the character has all the stuff memorized, right. the author does too. And you're like, wow, right. like, how, do, how does Rucka do that? How, like, mm -hmm. does he have Alice in Wonderland? It, like, a, is he on some Alice in Wonderland database? And first he writes her dialogue as a normal person's dialogue, and then he like goes through the database to try to match her. Does he just know Alice in Wonderland that well? Or does he just open to a page, drop his finger and go, well, now we're gonna make that work? Because she, as you pointed out, like you just thought it was her words and she and does make sense. Like it's not total right, right. nonsense. Exactly. And so there's there's definitely some strategy to the way he's deploying it, but it's, it's a little off-putting, like at a point, like I said, I try to think of like, what if I was joining a crime organization or, you know, right, like right, a startup, right. whatever. And then my boss came in and I realized my boss was like speaking only in lines from X. You know, they're they're only speaking in lines from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which would entertain oh me. And, and there's one where I probably would get the reference every single time. But like, how, how good of a leader can that person be? I just can't get over it. It's really funny to me. Right. And I think, like, you know, if it's something that that's so cultural, ingrained, like you know look uh, like you know um i am your father that kind of thing it's like okay that makes sense because it's so culturally ingrained that every like 90 percent people will get it but when you take something that is like kind of like you know maybe 10 percent will get it it's kind of like i feel i personally think that it's a little bit of a waste but you know what good for you trying to you know work it in the in the co in the comic i'm not saying that it's wrong I'm no it's not wrong at all i have a very a really similar feeling to you like i it's it is. Yeah, it's, it's a choice. It's a very specific choice. So we, we're right. now kind of towards the end of the second issue of this run. So Batwoman kind of shakes down all the criminals in town. She finds out this new crime boss is coming in. She goes to confront her. It turns out to be Alice. And I want to switch back to talking about art for a moment as we head into the, right. the remainder of this first arc. So this, this page, I actually skipped and I closed the book to like go have a, a nap or a bite to eat or something because I was sure it was the cover of the next issue. But this is actually a, a page of panels. In, right. on the interior of the book, and it shows how influenced J.H. Williams is by uh, Art Nouveau art, especially artists like Alphonse Mucha, who's one of my favorites. I have Mucha um, subway advertisements, which are also paintings hanging up in my kitchen. And uh, and it's just spectacular. And part of, part of this art style, it's not necessarily the parallelism, although this has a lot of really like parallel defined structure in it, but it's that she's like framed out and then there's something behind her and then she's silhouetted, silhouetted on that. And then she has this, it's just the whole setup of it because his art tends to be like a single woman because it's and it's she's like doing some action she's been frozen in time and it's almost like a portrait of her but then there's a lot of these like objects in the back and I, I've never taken art history all that I know I've absorbed through my wife and her sister um, who both uh, had, had art majors in college but even right. layperson me it, it totally stuck out for me. Right. And that's the thing, like, you know, talking, speaking of this issue, particularly, like, you know, speaking of like, you know, admiring art, because every single page is just 
awesome like you know and then we have the thing that in um, over here kate kane like you know she uh, batwoman gets uh, drugged uh, and then so she has a psychedelic you know um a, like a psychedelic episode and you know the just the the lay of that or you know the way it's shown it's the color changes color scheme changes you know everything like becomes so much more psychedelic and then you are you are having a trippy moment as well it almost starts to like case, she's like leaking color like her red right. Or like it feels like she's fading away because yeah. look, it's like you know, like you know, it's like she's like the most like you know, like the brightest, and then as she as the page goes this way, it's kind of like we get a flashback from her childhood that kind of comes into later on, and then you know, she it just the memory is like much more fader, and then you, I myself felt a little bit like like you know, a little bit drugged out, like you know, I felt like oh my god, like what's going on, and yeah, and that's all because of the there's not a lot of words going on, it's all because of the art. And I also want to point out again, I'll keep coming back to the colors here, because you know what, I think colors are frequently ignored by comic readers yes, because they don't right. have the vocabulary to talk about them at all. And so then they're afraid to talk about them, which is crazy. Like talk about how you react. Same with lettering. You hardly ever hear people talk about lettering in comics, but it's like, you don't have to be an expert in lettering. Just start out with, is it doing its job? How does it make you feel? And then eventually you'll get the vocabulary. And I think right. go going a few pages before that, um, to look at this spread at the beginning of this issue, there's so these monsters are the cult that previously had captured her. There is a very different quality to the monsters in the art to Alice and Batwoman. The monsters have this almost like storybook quality to them where they're like super hyper over rendered. Their colors are really pushed. They have a lot more ink lines on them. They, they look like a child's storybook. Whereas Batwoman looks like an old movie photograph. And they right. sometimes interact in the same panel with each other. And, and you get to see these things side by side, but that's not, it's not just Jay Williams drawing them with more detail. There's that. But then Dave Stewart is using like a totally different color palette on them to Batwoman. And he's rendering the lighting effects really differently because the lighting on them like glistens and um, and like kind of shows all the color in their skin or their fur. Whereas again, the Batwoman lighting tends to be like, like she's got like a bright flash photography on her. If we get back to this first page and we look right. at how he does her lip, like it right. looks like Faria and Faria has her bright red lipstick. Like it's just got this little glint right off of the red. <laughs> and that's all that you get really right now. You kind of have that effect going. Yeah, I, it, it was all planned, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's her signature lip. It's not because we're reading, it's not because we're reading this issue right now and uh and it's just right. again like those were choices you don't do that by mistake maybe you do it by mistake once but you can't keep it up by mistake through a whole series and so it just goes to right. show like how much thought and planning is put in here so um from yeah. there, well please another go ahead. Thing that, no another thing i noticed and this is something that you pointed out to me that the bad guy like you know speaking of lettering and you know uh the thought bubbles yeah. like you pointed out to me that all the villains usually have black background with white um, lettering and uh, heroes have the other way around and this is like the first time I noticed it I'm like oh my god that's true because everything that Ellis says is in black background with white lettering versus everyone else is like that and if you think about this a little bit for I we could here's another thing I could do a whole episode on um so <laughs> lettering. that's called reversed out lettering like when it's the color is white and it's knocked out of the background color so like these whoa action figure avalanche um these <laughs> um marvel omnibuses it's like the white is reversed out from the red right and uh and if you can't necessarily use the same font at the same weight to accomplish that as you're using for your other characters because the font might be too thin to really read as knocked out white because think about how that gets printed like if you were printing that page in your printer it's not like it's printing white on black it's got to print all of the black and just leave space for the letter o in mm. the middle and so it's really right. easy to lose those letters so if you look at the lettering here and i'll use a, pa a page that i am quite certain we're going to be talking about in a second um, right you see that the font for Alice is a totally different font than the Batwoman font. And it's not one of these like super precious scripty cursive fonts, which are really hard to read knocked out on a color. Right. It's actually a font, like it's got a little bit of, um, it's like a little bit italic, but it's serifed. Uh, and which the normal comic book font is not so serifs are when there's like extra little strokes on the end of each letter. Right. And this is a serif mm -hmm. font and Batwoman's font is not. So the letterer, who I will look up the credits so we can talk about how great they are. Um, the letterer made a very specific choice. Todd Klein, who's a super famous letterer, um, made a very specific choice to do that um, 
white on black knockout, but to make it really readable and and to give a convey something about Alice, like the fact that it's got the serifs, the fact that it's um, in that slightly italic font is very literary. It's like almost takes you right to uh, Lewis Carroll's um, the the uh, wild the Jabberwocky poem in my mind. Right. Right. I, I'm I'm so I'm learning so much about these things. Oh my God! I'm so glad that I you know I get to chat with you about these things because I I mean you know as as we know I'm a very you know uh, uncultured swine me. No, just that's kind of, not fair. Just just kind of just walk past all of this. <laughs> but no, you you're right. I mean you know the, the, now that I'm looking at it, that that's actually a very interesting point. I never saw that before. Like now well, I'm going to always look for it. And the thing that I say, especially to comic book readers, like art is art. Let's my voice cracks. Art is hard. Art is hard, not only to do but to appreciate because you feel like there's rules and and all we go all through school having to write essays and read all these classic novels. So we feel like, well, at least I know how to evaluate plot. But then people get scared of talking about the art in comic books. And I'm like, a, like I said, talk about how it makes you feel. But b, like, let that be your doorway. Comic books are art. Like, you know, I'm talking about Alphonse Mucha doing subway advertisements. That is totally not different, the, the amount of people that saw and consumed those, to the way that people consume artwork in comic books now. It's one of the mediums that has the most illustration involved in it in the whole world. So, like, right. yeah, you do. If you read comic books, you're an art lover. You love art. You have every right. reason to be able to talk about it and critique it. And, like, go in, man. Like, learn about it. Because as you talk about it more, you'll learn these things and you'll pick up the vocabulary. And, and then you get to then you get to understand art too and and that's something that you know i'm actually realizing it as we as i'm reading more and more you know that different types of arts that you can have and i think especially with like you know i can differentiate between really bad art and really good art <laughs> like, right you, know, you, you have like, at least like a basic quality de detector of like that is bad right. no i mean oh my god like when it's a bad like it's true though because i never actually i this i i mean i think like a couple of months like you know sorry a couple of weeks ago i was reading green green arrow by my my grail and two of the issues were the most horrible horrendous art i've ever seen and even though it was a very you know a very um quintessent like in a very important issue i, I didn't care for it I really didn't care for it. It just took me out. And that's when I'm like, oh my God, I, I'm beginning to learn about art or beginning to appreciate art. That's and, pretty much it. Like, and so and, and then coming, coming no, here, don't. it's just, no, no, I'm just saying that. And then, then from that, then reading here, then I'm like, okay, this is like class A art. Like this is fantastic. Well, and let's talk about now merging our critique of art and our understanding of literary canon. Right. So as it turns out, we're, Spoiler, we're going to talk about spoilers because we're talking about right. this whole run. As it turns out, Alice is, we come to understand it, Batwoman's long thought dead twin sister, which right. is a major twist. This panel comes at the beginning of that issue. Um, right. Yet look at it. Their faces are the same. This is Alice's face. This is Batwoman's face. And the middle bit that's in that kind of um, green tone here is their combined face. And there's right. no discontinuity whatsoever. I mean, the art is literally telling you they have the same face right. uh, without the story telling you. And like, it's it leads to this really fun moment of you actually realize something about the character before Batwoman finds out. And I think that that's such a fun way to get a surprise or a cliffhanger in a comic book when you figured it out before the character, because it gives you, it's kind of like when you know the horror movie, you know, the person's coming right, into right, a room right. where the killer is, you're like, oh gosh, oh no, oh no. Yeah. Um, and, and that really, the art let us do that. Like the story never was like, little does she know it's her sister. Okay, continue. <laughs> um, and, and, and by the end of the issue, I was like, Yes, because, you know, especially like, you know, they had a fight scene. I'm like, oh, no, don't, you know, like, you know, I, I actually like, like the same way, like this art, like, this panel kind of I'm like, oh, so I initially thought that's her mother, you know, oh. that, you know like, you know, be, but you still they, got they, that they were related. Right, right. I thought that they were related because the thing is like just before that, you know, they have a discussion like, you know, they, uh, there is a situation with her and her stepmother. Like, you know, she doesn't necessarily like her stepmother and her stepmother doesn't like her. Um, I think like, you know, she's she's a I think she's a senator. And then, you know, she doesn't appreciate her being gay and everything. So uh, there's like a certain tension. So I thought that that's her mother that, you know, that, uh, so that's what he was alluding to. And then, you know, then it comes out that it's, a, it's her, it's her sister. And there's like a very, uh, like a very interesting uh, origin story of her as associated with that, that comes out later. 
Well, I think we can actually get to the orange history in just a second because we're at the end of this arc here. I want to talk about, again, a specific page of art that I know we've both commented on right. to each other in prep oh for this. Uh, because, so Williams, the, here's the conflict between Batwoman and this woman that's defending Alice on this plane that Batwoman has just jumped onto as one does right. if you're a Batwoman. <laughs> and, and the only thing we see about the conflict here is her like leaping in with this kick. And then we turn the page and she is just laid out, this this woman who is fighting her. But if, and so right. I, when I was first reading it, I kind of whipped right by that page. And I'm like, okay, I guess that happened quickly. But then if you go back and look at this art, all of the conflict of the fight is hidden just in red and black in these lightning bolts around the main panel of the fight here. And right. it's, it's just goes to show like how much J.H. Williams is like transforming the medium and using the page. On most comic pages, they would just be there to direct your attention inward, right. but they actually are telling a story like radially around the page. Right. And you know, one of the things though, like I, I, I was like, because I had the same exact, same exact experience as you did. Like, you know, I saw that, oh, she's jumping in onto the plane. I'm like, okay, that's... Sure. I mean, you know, all, all, all of us regular person can do that. <laughs> and then she's going towards this lady. And then the next page, she was lying on the ground. I'm like, wait, okay, no one is that good. Come on, except for Batman. But you know, even yeah. though just because you have the bat in it, then I went back. I'm like, Oh, no, look, they were fighting in the in the arrows. And it's almost as if like she was hitting her with a lightning kind of effect. And then I couldn't help but remember the Lego Batman when he says that we're gonna kick people's ass so hard that, <laughs> that our action will magically appear in the thin air. So I could, I oh, does that help Lego Batman um, qualifies that there's like pals and, and things? Yeah, pals, like, you know, we're going to kick, like, kick so hard that, you know, that our, our action will magically appear in the air. That's so there's funny. a line like that. And then, you know, as I was thinking about that a little bit too, it was like crack, snap, smoke. I'm like, what is that? <laughs> but you know, it was very joyful to uh, to see that, and you know, I, I like like you said, like it's just perfect. Like every every pa page of this book, it's just you know tells you much more. Like pictures is a thousand words. It's this this book. That's so. I actually, I wanted to give you one that I know that you love. I'll just hold it up, oh and I want God. you to talk about it because oh my God, just because I know you have some things to say, and then we'll move right. on to the next one. Yeah, it's just like, you know, it just goes in ra radio and, you know, on the top you have like the black, like, you know, you have the red, like, you know, just black, bat woman's like all red and black. And then on the other side of contrast of is it blue and white, which is pretty much just a contrast of it. And then you just see that all the, the two characters and their contradiction, that's all perfect, just perfectly captured in. And I was actually looking for uh, a way to like print that you know to get an art print so i can hang it in my wall because it was so good and speaking of like art that is worthy of museum this arc ends with alice falling from the plane we and then batwoman gets knocked to black and white with this little pop of red where alice stabbed her and then just gets knocked straight to black and white um with none of this ink washing as she has this moment of realization that her sister has fallen from the plane and then we go into this arc um called go mm -hmm. 